Are you fed up with training inefficient for loops to train your ML models? Say never again to strange hacks that you have to do to split your train test and validation sets properly. Say goodbye to annoying data slicing for loops today with PyTorch datasets and data loaders. We will cover how you can easily create datasets in PyTorch and train lightning fast with data loaders in both PyTorch and PyTorch Lightning. With that being said, let's jump right in. So I split the notebook into uh, dataset and imports. We are going to look at the, the beginning, then what is actually batching, what is it used for, why would you want to know about it, how to do it properly with part PyTorch data loader and datasets. Then we'll go into an MVP example, so the bare minimum you want to get away with, but stay until the end because we will look into a proper example how to use this in a real life PyTorch Lite example pull example so don't worry it won't be complicated I'll make it really easy and you will be up to speed in no more than 15 minutes I hope so first off what do we import a lot of torch and pandas basically some SQL learn for feature scaling some PyTorch lightning and that's basically it cool what are we going to um, predict today we are going to do a multi-class example so basically we are going to predict given some features whether uh, a sample is what type of star it is. So we have red stars, brown dwarfs, white dwarfs, etc., etc. I put it into a CSV, so we basically just load it up. And if we see the results here, we'll basically use the temperature and some color and so on. Why batching? Generally speaking, you want to load your entire data set into the memory, but more often than not, you just don't have the memory or the fast enough memory to do this with large, let's say, image data sets. So you will have to do, well, you know, batches. What's batch? A batch is basically a chunk of a data set. So if you have 100 examples and you batch this into uh, batches of 10, you then have 10 mini batches or small batches of size 10 that you will give to the model and do the parallel, parallel processing on simultaneously. So you send the model usually actually like 10 examples at once and not just one because it's terribly inefficient. Let's look at this in code. First off, we'll just load off a star uh, our data set and here this is just a function that does nothing but it just illustrates that this is your model forward pass. Great. So first example, uh, if you would have a batch size one, you would iterate over your epochs and then here in Pandas you have this iter row concept and then basically what you do is you give your model one example per time. That's maybe how you do it in prediction mode, but it's not how you should train models. The other extreme and probably not what you want to do is the maximum batch size. So you throw your entire data set at each training or at each epoch into your model and just do your calculations on this. This has two downsides. One, mostly you won't have the memory for this. The second one is actually the models need somewhat smaller batches to learn better, you know, like if the update step is only once, it often will lead to failures. Anyway, now this proper example is if you actually do your for loop for each epoch and then what you do is you chunk your example. So you cut your data set of 100 into 10 pieces, 8 a 10. What we do here now, we have 240 examples and we cut it into a chunk size of 8. So that will reduce into 30 batches of size 8. And let's look at what this looks. So the first example we had above, we basically have the size 7. So the shape of, of your sample is always 7 because you have 7 features. Now in the maximum batch example, because we have 240 um, examples in our data set, we will have 240 times 7. And now in the proper batching example, I only put, uh, printed the top few, you have eight times seven. Um, of course, you have this than 30 times. So your shape will be 30 times eight times seven. How to do it properly. So this is of course not how you do it, how I just showed it. What you wanna do is in practice is use the PyTorch data loader and data set, and it's really extremely useful. The custom dataset example, it's often not brought up and you can load datasets from the internet directly in this format, but we'll do a custom one because I really feel that this gives you the extra edge, even more so when we get to the fancy example down below where we'll do it with PyTorch Lightning and then you have directly validation 
uh, test set and training set in one thing. Great. So what do you have to do? First of all, you have to inherit from the dataset class. Dataset class is something that just lives in PyTorch Utils, and then you give it a name. Cool. Now you need to define three functions. You have the init function, the len function, and the get item function. These are the minimal functions you will need to program every time. You can do more, you can not do less. Good. What you do in the init function is you load the data and convert it. Then what do we do here? We load our data set from the CSV. We split the labels from the features. Then we drop actually the multi uh, the categorical variables because we just don't want to handle them for the simple tutorial such that we are quick. Cool. Um, then we convert it to torch and we convert also the label to torch. Why do we convert it to torch? Because PyTorch only eats, well, their own shape. So they don't eat pandas and they don't eat NumPy. They want, uh, well, torch tensors. Basically, this is the syntax, how you do it. Don't think too much about it. Now, the other two functions, and this is kind of the hard. Um, it needs a len function. This simply returns the total amount of samples in your data set. In our case, it will uh, simply return the length of the data set. Right, so this is 240, even if it's a tensor still. Cool, then get item. What does get item do? It gets you the item or the sample at the i-th position of the data set and the label with it. Let's just shortly go over the slightly more complicated parts here. So basically, how will your data frame look at this place? It will basically just have four features in it. So it's a pandas or an Excel sheet, let's think about it with four times 240, uh, well, 240 rows and four columns. Now, then we convert this to NumPy and then we convert this to Tensor. That's all we do. For the labels, we do the exactly same thing, except that we have to reshape it to minus one because, um, well, basically it's a sing single sample, so you don't want it to have a, be in an array, if that makes sense. Cool. Now let's actually initialize our first custom star data set. And what can you do with this amazing thing? Actually, not that much. You can iterate over it and you can get the IF position of a data set. You say like, wow, hey, that's basically a Python dictionary or some list or something. And wait a second, especially then in the more fancy example, you'll see why it's useful. A data set only becomes useful once we get into data loaders. So what is a data loader? A data loader is a PyTorch function that helps you return your samples in the right shuffled whatever batch sized order and what it takes as an input argument is a data set the thing we just defined above you have all of these fancy arguments basically you don't need all of this what you really want to know is these four arguments here but just to tell you they exist and most of them will be useful in very rare instances where you really want to get the last itch of performance out of your machine learning model or something else but really in the most cases you can do with these uh, it's actually five arguments so let's only cover them for this short tutorial you have the data set that's what we created above you have a batch size this influences in what shape the batches are returned then you have a shuffle equals false. This is default false. So what does it do? Every time you call again your iteration over the um, over the data set, you will get a different uh, shuffling of the data set, which is what you want when you're doing your training loop, right? So you want to shuffle it every epoch. Good. Drop last. Default is false again. So be very careful because, because this is an extremely common reason for errors, especially if you're not used to it. It simply removes the last drop, um, last batch. Number of workers, this controls the level of parallelism, but uses more memory. You want to kind of increase this uh, if your model is taking too long to load your data, but only if you, if you have the resources available in your machine. We'll go now over each argument in detail, so don't worry if you didn't get that. That's only like a first introduction and it'll come in very handy in the last example. Good. So we'll create our data loader with, let's say, the data set we just created above. So this is the star data set we created here. And then we give it a batch size of 64. We say two workers, so we we'll actually have two workers that in parallel shuffle this data for us, which makes it faster. We have shuffle equals true on drop last. So what will this do? Let's say pretend we want to do for epoch in one, two, three, whatever. And you will then iterate the data loader like this. So you can say for batch and label in data loader, blah, blah, blah. I only printed it now in the very first 
uh, iteration and this is what we see here. So this should be 64 by 4. Because Why? Because we have four features and we calculate, uh, we defined the batch size 64. Now when you we go over the batches, so I only printed now the shapes of the of the batch itself, it will always print 64 times 4. In one instance the last one it will actually be uh, 48. So how can we avoid this? We can say drop last true. So now if we go over it, we will actually see that we've dropped the 48 uneven batches in that sense. So that's what drop last does. Sometimes your model cannot handle this. Uh, it's maybe somehow hard configured to work with the batch size in a certain way. In PyTorch Lightning, by the way, you can actually learn this. So check out my tutorial on PyTorch Lightning if you want to know more about this. What else can we configure? Let's say we'll go with the batch size 32. Simple as that. You see now it is 32 and that is just amazing. It's extremely efficient. It will also shuffle it every time. So if you uh, pay now attention to the label order 0, 5, 1, if we call now the same thing again for the next epoch, for example, it's 1, 2, 0. So it will actually shuffle these batches every time or like these samples every time uh, before it returns them. This can be a massive amount of code if you don't have a tool like this. And it will come especially handy with PyTorch Lightning. Great, you say, um, how do we build a simple model? Uh, just to get your minimal viable product ready, we'll do now a super simple PyTorch example. It will not be good, but I just wanna do it so you know how to use this data loader in vanilla PyTorch without PyTorch Lightning, which is really what I would advise. Great, we'll define a um, simple model, whatever class. We'll inherit from Torch and then module how you do it. Then we define a model. Uh, it's just basically uh, some dense layers, a bit dropout and, and relu, just to be comparable with the below. Our forward pass is straight simple. We'll uh, call these layers in order and then we do a softmax. Why? Because it's multi-class and uh, you want to get the highest probability to then compare it. Great. Um, now, how do you create a model? You simply initialize it like this in PyTorch. You again get to the data loader. This time we want to use it for training. We want to use a batch size of four because with a, such a small data set like 240, the um, gradient updates will be a bit hard on you if you don't do it this way. You could theoretically update this, but only if you have like a way bigger, bigger data set. We only have 240 today because it's a simple example. We'll say drop last because we didn't program anything special to make it work. Also, it, I think it's uh, divisible by four anyway, so no worries there. We'll define an optimizer and we'll set the model into training. Let's look at how you now iterate over model and do a training loop where the data loader actually comes handy in. With a four epoch in, we wanna do 20 epochs. Then we iterate the batch and the label. So this will be our uh, four by four um, batch matrix, whatever. And the labels will be these uh, four labels we saw above. So basically just numbers between zero and five. Good. We uh, average out the gradients, we do a forward pass and we calculate a loss object. We do a backwards and a step, blah, blah, blah. And you just do this 20 times and the batch loader, uh, the data loader, shuffles the data every single iteration, which is really cool. If you ever did this without the data loader, you know that it's just a lot more code and you have to make be careful that everything is shuffled and it's just like five, six more lines and there's a lot more cool features that you can use, else we'll show in a second. Good, let's just evaluate the model, uh, put the accuracy. Here now, just because it's quick and dirty, we'll do a new data loader, say, hey, we want the entire data set. So that's that all in one batch example I talked about. And then we can basically just iterate. So this loop will only iterate, you know, it once. Exactly, and then we calculate the accuracy. So here we have to take the argmax from torch, just such that it's um, not a probability space of like four uh, of the five possible classes and it's just like one label that we want to compare against for our accuracy. Great. You see, it's terrible. It's a uh, 40% accuracy. Why is that? If you ever saw my video on feature scaling, you know it's probably because of the feature scaling. And this is what we'll now do in our really cool PyTorch Lightning full example. Now, how would I actually use this in practice? Uh, this one way, of course, it gets arbitrarily big and depending on, I don't know, you want to do data augmentation with images and whatever, you can all do this in here. 
um, so much more. But for today, we'll do with like a simple example that I consider a really good starting point for you. I usually like to uh, make three data sets, a, train, a validation and a test set. So the train set you use for actually training your model, the validation set you usually use for early stopping, which will not implement. Watch my video on PyTorch Lightning to know more about how you would implement early stopping. It's not more, but it just makes the tutorial a minute longer. And of course, a test set, because, well, you want to have a model that generalizes well in practice. Great. Let's define a proper data set this time. Again, it's a custom star data set and um, we read our CSV. We sample this time actually, so we have to shuffle ourselves if we do it this way. Uh, why? Because the data set is actually sorted by classes and if you would not shuffle before you split your data, you'll have a problem. So we'll go with a train split of 60% for training, 20% for validation and 20% for test. The label again, we split it off. We drop the categorical variables. And now what we'll do here is we'll actually numply split the things. So it, this basically just splits it into um, a 60% set, a 20% set and a 20% set. And the same thing for the labels. Now, because we saw that our model was performing really badly, we want to scale our training data. How do we do this? We do this with sklearn as the scaler. Uh, if you don't know too much about standard scalers, don't worry too much. I have an entire video about feature scaling and it's really, it makes a difference between 40% uh, and 85% in this example. Now again, why do you only want to use your scaler and your training data? Because somewhere in the future, let's think stock prices, if you scale on uh, stock price from 100 to 1000, and in the future, the stock price rises to 1,500, you have a bit of a problem because you've never seen this in your trainer set. And maybe this introduces some sort of bias in your data set that you're not aware of. In this example, it's probably okay, but just, you know, to do it right, let's do it this way. So we only call the scaler on our training data set. Now we'll store all these things actually in our class custom star data set, transform these data splits. So we'll just transform the features and not the labels, of course. Great. Um, this is basically it. No, not entirely. We need again our two favorite functions. Remember, these two, these three are necessary in it, length and get item. Uh, the get item again just returns the self.dataset, self.labels. Now, what you may have noticed, we did not define a self.dataset above here in this init. This is why we define this additional method. As I want to show you, you can also define more methods and I call it set fold. So basically you hand this function your uh, type. We have the three types, train, test and val. This is an enum. If um, you've never seen it, it's not that common in Python. It's very common in most other programming language. Don't worry too much. It's basically just some categorical variable that you can give into your code and it looks kind of nice, you know. This will come in very handy in a second. Great. Now the first last thing we have to do, we scale our data um, here for the data set and here for the label, depending on what the user selected, train, validation or test. And then you again have a complete data set like above, with the only difference being here the data set and the label for the various classes. Now, how do you use it? First, you initialize it like this. And then what you actually have to do is you have to do a deep copy of this object and then set the fold to train, test or validation. Um, I'll just shortly do this to show you that we have it and that you can use it just as before. Great, we have now three split, completely split um, sets and they have 60, 20 and 20 in their set. So for example, here in the train set, we have 144, which seems to be approximately 60% of 240. Great. Now, just to show you, there's also an easier way to do this, but it's a bit more annoying in practice. I do it differently because then I have this um, init function where I can really go wild with all my uh, feature scaling, my feature and data augmentation and everything. But you could also just split the data set. So the entire splitting logic that we have above, you can set into basically one example. So if this is enough for you, it sometimes works. I just wanted to show you both ways so you're ready for practice and are not confused. Great. So here we effectively split the 144 into 124, 10 and 10, which again adds up to 144. And uh, then we just iterate it over the length to show you that we have now three completely functioning data sets.
that you could also use in the next step. Now let's build a real proper cool damn model. This is a bit more fancy with lightning module. I think it, with PyTorch you can do the exactly same thing, it's just more code, so we'll use the lightning module. The same thing as above, we'll inherit this time from lightning module because it's PyTorch lightning. Again, if you're interested in more details on the lightning module, I really recommend my video on PyTorch lightning. Great, so uh, we set our data set here in the self function, so you pass it into your model creation. We say we have six classes and four features, basically the same model as above. Um, there is four features coming in and six classes going on, plus some relu dropout, blah, blah, blah. Then we have accuracy, and this is really cool because we can now print the accuracy every validation with light, uh, PyTorch Lightning from the validation set and not from the train set so that we know while it's training how it's performing are we overfitting are we underfitting whatever cool forward the same stuff as above you call the model you do the log softmax just to get a bit better numbers and the training step is basically the same just that you um, have a loss so the same thing we did above inside the loop you have here as a function if you're not familiar with pytorch lightning great now the validation set uh, step is basically the same as above with the small difference that now we do it on the validation set. I'll show you in a second. Uh, you do calculate the accuracy and you print the accuracy because it's really nice. For the test step we simply copy the validation step which is really handy. The only difference really is here this print string but it's the same thing as in the forward with the small difference that we calculate the accuracy and print it directly to the shell. Now, why did we do all of this crazy work with data loaders? Uh, the optimizer not to be forgotten, but anyway, not so interesting. Here are our free data loaders and it's extremely simple. So we pass in the free data sets, as we see down below. Then we call it with our batch size. So it's four in this case, you could go arbitrarily high or low, depending on whatever GPUs you have access to or CPUs or TPUs or whatever. And now you wanna shuffle the train data you want to say false to the uh, test and validation data and that's basically it. So this is how easy it can be. And why do you do all of this? Now let's actually go and train this. Remember this, before we were 40% and now we are at uh, around validation accuracy already of like 90%. We see here the loss, it's really cool. All of this is handled directly by the data loaders. And if you have configured with PyTorch Lightning here a test data loader, you can simply hit trainer.test and call this. And then we will in the final step here calculate the simple test accuracy and test loss for our test set. This is how simple it can be with PyTorch Lightning data loaders and data sets. I hope you learned so much today because I really love this function and I think it's not properly explained out there. Often they just load things from the internet and yeah. Please subscribe and like. This was my approach to what you should know about data loaders and data sets in PyTorch.